Hey, what's up Seekers, welcome back. We're doing a little mini-series on Hasidism here. In the first video we spoke about its history and philosophy, in the second video we dove a little deeper into its bi-directionality and metaphysics, in this third video we're going to continue directly from where we left off last time, speaking about the way in which the categories between the human and the divine, the ayin and the yesh, get blurred and crossed, but we're going to shift our focus to the way that this is achieved in the avodah, in the inner work of the chassid. The way which one goes about achieving this blurring of boundaries between God and human, the divine and the mundane, the sublime and the ordinary, is via a twofold process, bittel and vekut, roughly translated as nullification or negation of the self, that's bittel, in order to cleave, cling, attach oneself, or be joined to or united with God, Dvekut. The term Dvekut first appears in its root form in the beginning of the book of Genesis, describing the sexual union between man and woman, in which they literally become one flesh in that of the child. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Genesis 2.24 All of the sexual, corporeal, matrimonial, unificative, procreative connotations latent in this first use of the term davak will go on to remain alive and present when this word is taken up again by the Hasidic practitioner a few thousand years later. What a wild thing words are. The initial way that Hasidot prescribes for the individual to attain this kind of unity with God is by beginning with what it calls hiskafia, literally to suppress or subdue, to withhold oneself from non-essential pleasures that simply serve to gratify what Hasidut calls the nefesh habahamit, the animal or bestial soul, the base elements of the human with simple, self-serving, selfish, hedonistic intentions and desires. This spiritual work of hiskafia, of practicing self-restraint and abstaining from unnecessary indulgences, is the first stop in one's journey which culminates in a state which Hasidut calls bitul hayesh, negation of the ego, a state of deep humility and selflessness. This process of delayed gratification geared towards decentering the ego is basic to any true spiritual journey, and as such, finds parallels in many of the world's mystical and wisdom traditions and in contemporary spiritual and mental health practices today. In the language of contemporary cognitive science, this process allows us to see reality as it truly is, or at least much more accurately, no longer obscured by the cognitive bias and fallacy that everything revolves around me. A momentary release from the imprisonment of our own egocentric perspectives, in which the salience of reality is finally capable of eclipsing the narcissistic glow of our own ego, to quote professor of psychology and cognitive science, my friend John Verveke. This salient reality, back in Hasidic language, would of course be God which one, according to Hasidot, is able to perceive, to taste and see, once the superficial veneer and facade of separation secreted by our egos is dissolved and stripped back, under whose glasses all phenomena is perceived under the rubric of how can this serve me, how can this maximize my pleasure and minimize my pain, which in and of itself isn't a bad thing, but when it becomes the only glasses we know how to see the world through, to the extent that we begin to confuse them with our very own eyes, and we begin to see only an objectified world, ripe for possession, exploitation, and competition, even if success in those realms comes at the expense of others, creating a vicious cycle of greed, jealousy, insecurity, and hatred, poisoning each other, the planet, and eventually ourselves, with the toxic, noxious fumes of I, me, and mine, a profane gaze which creates a profane reality. This vision of a fallen world, seen through these broken glasses, Chasidut calls Alma de Iskasya, the world of concealment, or Alma de Pruda, the world of separation, fragmentation, and alienation. But if we can remove those scales from our eyes, to see clearly, to see how everything in existence exists in the finest delicate dance, a vast single organism interconnected and interdependent, in which not a single leaf moves that does not affect the symmetry and harmony of all of existence as a whole, a vision which inspires awe and wonder, kindness and care, 
in the realization that Ein Ebel Vade, there is nothing but God, and therefore all is truly you, and all is truly sacred. This is the gift of Bittel, the gift of Ayin, of discovering that one is truly nothing, and truly everything. And in that realization, we can let go of the pursuit that keeps us shackled up in constant crippling debt to the ego, to the illusion of what we think will bring us happiness and fulfillment, but that which we already know to be a lie, and instead allows us to embrace the simplest and truest pleasures of life that cost nothing at all and that keep on giving, to be kind to a stranger, to help a friend in need, to soak our souls in prayer and nature, to smile along with the child, to laugh with the elderly, to hold the hand of the lonely, the needy, the sick, the vulnerable, the fragile, the hurting, to be kind to another, to savor the sensuality of life so often taken for granted, to sit with a poem, a novel, a film, a sunrise, a fleeting dream, a wilting flower. The list goes on, I think you get the gist. And the world which we reveal, that we create from this void, from this new perspective, is what Chastut calls Alma Dit Galia, the revealed world, or Alma Di Chuda, the unified, united world. This is the aim of the philosophy of Chassidut, to change one's basic conception and perception of reality, to go from seeing the world as a meaningless, illusory, vacuous place, devoid of godliness, a profane world, to peering beyond the veil, to see the divine reality in all things, the eternal vow in every face and in every moment, to realize that there is nothing but God. Chassidut, as the saying goes, inverts our basic axioms, where before Chassidut, one takes the world as a given and God as the novelty. However, after Chassidut, it is God who becomes the given and the world which becomes the novel. To return for a second from theorizing, from the Haskalah of Chassidut, the theory of Chassidut, back to Avodah, the realm of Chassidic practice, the work of the Chassid is to release themselves from the tyranny of the animal soul. By turning it from an abusive master into an obedient helper, which can be harnessed for the good, for God. And this is the process of tapping into and identifying with our other soul, what Chassidut calls the Nefesh HaElokit, the divine soul, which by its natural disposition craves unity, love, intimacy, and kindness. And through the Hasidic spiritual practices of Hitbodidut and Hitbonunut, self-isolation, meditation, and contemplation, among others, one can learn to center themselves and consequently their reality in and from the perspective of the divine soul, which sees all of reality in its own reflection as it really is, as God. This is the unique Hasidic twist on the classic practice of Shiviti Hashem the Negdi Tamid, to place God before oneself at all times, to see God in all things and all moments. Now, all of this, of course, is a lot easier said than done. That very real struggle and conflict between immediate short-term gratification chasing quick and easy pleasures, ta'avot in the language of chasidut, versus committing oneself to delayed gratification for real, long-term, far-sighted goals that serve to better and strengthen us, our relationships, our friendships, families, communities, and the world as a whole, those things that take real work, isn't easy. There's a chasidic jest which is told that had God had only put all of the temptations, all of the sugary, fatty, shiny, pretty, alluring things in the book, and kept them only in literary form, and instead took out the wholesome, the genuine, authentic, kind, diligent things out of the books and put them in front of our eyes in tangible form, the world would have long ago already reached a state of equilibrium and utopia. But then again, what value would there be without the struggle? This struggle between the real and the sensual, between the ideal and the actual, between certainty and doubt, faith and loneliness, fills countless volumes of Hasidic literature with the sole hope of encouraging, edging, and cajoling the Hasidic novice towards the good and the godly. Besides for this one model of avodah, of spiritual work, of changing the locus of our being, the center of our identity, and in doing so, shifting our perspective and choosing which world we want to live in, almost like picking between two parallel alternative universes, olam hasheker, a world of lies, a false world, and olam ha'emet, a world of truth, a real world, Hasidic thought teaches another model, one that works with the illusion, with the lies, with materiality, and transforms it into the sacred, the salient, and the real. Hasidut has many names for this. When speaking on the level of the individual in their internal work, 
Chassidut calls this process of transforming our inner and outer worlds, hitapcha, literally to turn over, to make a revolution, to transform the profane into the sacred. Hitapcha is the partner term to hiskafia, which we introduced earlier, remember? The work of abstaining from the godly. In one spiritual work, hiskafia, abstinence or restraint, must almost always precede his hapcha, this getting involved to try and change and transform a thing into a positive. And I think this is a very important point in so many spiritual traditions and in life in general, that one must always first exercise and demonstrate mastery over a thing before they can attempt to engage it and transform it. Otherwise, it will be the one transforming you to its machinations and not the other way around. This process dialectically mirrors the divine cosmic process. Just as God, through a process of self-restraint and tzimtzum, metamorphosizes into substance, into the world as we know it, we, God down here, complete the process by reversing it. Through mastering our own contraction and humility, through hiskafia, through restraint, we can effect a hishapcha, a transformation and transubstantiation of the material back into the godly. This theme, also known as avodar begashmiyot, working with the materiality, with the seemingly mundane and worldly, dovetails beautifully right onto the Lurianic paired notions of Shvira and Tikkun, the cosmic rupture and reconstructuring, the shattering and fixing of the worlds. Without getting too deep into Lurianic Kabbalistic mythology right now, the Ari Rabbi Isaac Luria, perhaps the most influential Kabbalist of all time, taught that at a certain point in the divine process of creation and emanation, there was a shattering, a violent disruption, a chaotic disarray, a cataclysmic mayhem, where the configuration that would have gone on to be the structure of our universe fell apart, tearing a hole in reality called Olam HaTohu, the world of chaos. And through the fissures and fractures of this broken world fell the sparks of the divine that were embedded in the failed abandoned structure. These sparks, these nodes, according to Luria, fell into our current iteration of reality, and were lost and hidden in the depths of materiality, in the klipot, the husks and shells of existence. And the higher that these sparks came from, the lower and deeper, according to Kabbalah, did they fall. If you've studied a little bit of Gnosticism, this should all be very familiar to you. Our work, according to Luria, is called Avodat Habirurim, the work of selecting, separating and sorting, purging and purifying, to locate these fallen sparks, and to redeem them from their cells, so they can be free to flutter back to their source. And, according to Luria, when every last spark is redeemed and reincorporated back into its source, back into the celestial pleroma, then, and only then, will the Messiah come. According to many Hasidic schools of thought, this task of redeeming the fallen sparks is not for everyone. It is often only for the tzaddik, the perfected saint, the giant amongst mortals, who is charged with the Herculean task of intentionally descending into the netherworld, into the klipot, the darkness, the shadows of the self, to redeem and rescue the deepest sparks fallen there. Following this rule that the higher something originates, the lower it falls, the deepest, purest intentions get warped, tangled and lost in the depth of the darkness, waiting for a warrior of light to don the garment of darkness to rescue them, waiting for that day when darkness shall shine as light when your darkness shall shine like noon, the night of luminescent darkness, the night of endless day when the moon shall shine bright like the sun, and when our deepest, truest aspirations, hopes and wishes will shine forth in everything we do, in every step and in every breath we take, redeemed with a re-imbued meaning into every moment of our lives, from our most painful, shameful, and darkest moments and memories to the simplest, most mundane, like the tying of our shoelaces in the morning. This redemption, is what the Chassid Arya Leib and Sarah traveled for miles over broken roads to watch his Rebbe, Reb Deber the Magad of Mezrich, tie his shoelaces, a cosmic shoelace tying demonstration, holding out hope for the rest of existence, every darn moment of it, that it may be shining darkness. Let us try a 21st century retelling of this Kabbalistic myth. In every project, journey, relationship, or endeavor that one embarks on, be it personal, interpersonal, or public, creative, professional, or spiritual, one ideally begins with a clear intention and an awareness of what they're setting out to accomplish, of what they would like to bring to fruition. The first thing one needs to do in any endeavor is to clear their canvas, to make space for what they're hoping to fill it with, 
to empty one's bag, to leave behind the past, to make space for the new, to put oneself aside, to stop talking and to start listening, to make space for the other one is hoping to invite in. Once we've made space, we can step back then into the arena, sit back down in front of the blank canvas. But at that moment, a complex duality begins to emerge. The split between means and ends. We pick up the brush so that we can dip it into the paint, so that we can apply the paint to the canvas, so that we can paint the picture, the original intention that arose in our mind. With careful observation, we can see the many layers of intention and execution, goals and ways, hows and whys, expanding away concentrically from the center, each alternating relative to the preceding layer. But what may occur between these layers is something of an amnesia. We forget why we lifted the brush, or come to confuse the means and ends, mistakenly believing that the employed means was the end goal, obsessing over it, forgetting that there ever was a desire to paint. This artistic metaphor can obviously be applied to all areas of life, relationships, education, religion, ethics, etc. Take this for example, you've embarked in a new relationship, taken all the prerequisite steps to invite love into your life, but then on your wedding day, you lose your cool, worrying about the flower arrangement and the menu, instead of being present to the wonder of entering into a sacred bond with the person you love. The diagnosis of this in the language of Hasidut and in the language of the Kabbalists is the rupture between inner and outer, intention and condition, ends and means, the ur and the keli, the light and the vessel. Not only have they split into inner and outer, which is unfortunate but inevitable, but they've lost their correct order and value and fallen into chaos, where the outer, the shell, the means have become all-encompassing, all-important, and the inner, the end, the intention, the spark, the why, has been lost somewhere along the way. This is what the Kabbalists call a shattering of the vessels and a falling of the sparks. Now, God knows how often this happens. This shattering plagues all of religion, society, and the human condition in general. But, tells us the Kabbalists, the sparks that were once there, the reasons why we embarked in the first place, are not forever lost. In fact, they are very much still present, hidden in the shells of our material activity, in the Olam Asiya, in the realm of action and actualization, so that if one could figuratively grab the hand of the artist, lost in their brush, or the mad spouse on their wedding day, and remind them, jog their memory back to their why, by asking them what the point of what they're doing is, we could bring them back to their intention, elevating it, the intention, the spark, to its rightful place. This is the process of redeeming the spark from the husk, the ascension of the real back into its source. This, to use the models, the dual metaphysics that we laid out in the beginning of the series, is all the story of Tzintzum Shiran Tikkun, on the first dualized level of reality that we spoke of. But in truth, in relation to the second level, all of this is a lie. Because in truth, there is no inner and outer, no spark and vessel, no means and ends, God and world. For in that place of ultimate paradoxical unity, where all dichotomies are false dichotomies, these two collapse into one another. In the messianic moment, ever present, ever coming, the inner becomes the outer and the outer the inner. The bark tastes like the fruit, the means becomes the end, life is recognized for the dance that it is, the beauty of being in each moment, not for some final teleological goal, but the divine in the here and the now, the true elevation of the sparks to the point where spark is vessel and vessel is spark. Here, the Yesha Nivra is the Yesha Miti, the created existence is the true existence. This is the apotheosis of matter. To quote a thinker who is not typically recognized as a Hasidic thinker, Ben Adam, son of man, bathe yourself in the ocean of matter, plunge into it where it's deepest and most violent, struggle in its currents and drink of its waters, for it cradled you long ago in your pre-conscious existence, and it is the ocean that will raise you up to God. This act of intentionality, of bathing yourself in the ocean of matter, plunging into it at its deepest, struggling with its waters, struggling with what Hasidut calls the Mayim Rabim, the raging waters of materiality, which in all of their violence and tempest cannot drown out the love, the Ahava Tivit Mesoteret, the subterranean spring of living waters, the deep, natural, hidden love between the human and God, a true self-love, because, and here again is that same secret, because you at bottom, you are God, for there is nothing but you. 
and therefore chastut mandates not escaping, but rather engaging the material world. In what it calls avodah begashmiot, working with the physicality of reality, with intentionality, with kavanah, to return meaning to the meaningless, the ends to the means, the spark to the vessel, to see the divinity within the mundane and the unitive within the broken. And Chassidut, from her earliest texts and masters, teaches that this intense, literally transformative intentionality, this kavana, can be applied to any act which one engages in, eating, walking, sleeping, waiting, making small talk, tying shoelaces, washing dishes, elevating all of them to the sublime, the divine, the heroic, and the sacred. Sin, it's been said, is anything done without kavana, without wholehearted intentionality. Kavana is the real work of remembering why we're doing whatever it is we're doing. It is the answer to the eternal, incessant question of the child, but why? Kavana is literally remembering for the Kabbalists. The work of putting the divine cosmic body, limb by limb, member by member, back together, rejoining and reintegrating the disjointed and dislocated, disorganized limbs of the queen, the Remach Evarm de Malka, until she, until we, until all that is, is reunited in harmony and love, until the vision is once again made whole. One of the more, shall we say, interesting outcomes of this idea was that one could connect deeply to God, to reality, not only through the 613 biblically prescribed methods of connections, known as the mitzvot, and through the study of Torah, conceived narrowly as the textual and oral heritage of canonical Judaism, but one could equally connect to God through the mundane when imbued with the awareness of the presence of the divine. Chassidot riffing on Proverbs 3.6 calls this avenue and mode of connection Bechol Drochecha Doyehu, knowing God in all one's ways, not only in those that were endorsed as explicitly sacred by Jewish standards. What's even more scandalous is the assertion that the intimacy achievable with God through the ordinary, through the uncommanded, through the Bechol Drochecha, was greater than that which could be achieved through the commanded agency of the mitzvah. An ordinary person could be close to God or brushing their teeth and thinking about God more than a rabbi on Yom Kippur dressed in white but thinking about what meal is going to come next. But if we remember that God was never absent from the material realm, from the Yesh HaNivra, and if anything is more present here because there's something about the realness and substantiality and tangibility of this world, that more closely and more perfectly mirrors and manifests the realness of the divine, more so than any of the higher ethereal worlds, which, mind you, are all equally unreal compared to God, then maybe this idea of the supremacy of connecting to God more deeply through the ordinary than through the explicitly sacred isn't so scandalous after all. Okay, fine. M maybe it is. There's something a lot more scandalous here, by the way. What I think might be the most unorthodox thought Chassidot has ever produced we hinted at it earlier, but I don't feel at complete liberty to make it explicit. I'll give you a hint, though. It's something to do with the Talmudic turn Kabbalistic concept of Yafa Kecha Ben Kecha Av. But enough said, let's move on. I'd like to conclude with one final meditation. Chassidut, in her relentless effort to understand herself, never tires of asking, but what is Chassidut? What is the Chidush, the novelty, the unique contribution of Chassidut to the world? We began this series with sharing some of the more cerebral answers given to that question from within the tradition herself, and have worked together to elaborate and hopefully make a bit more sense of them. But there is one time in Hasidic literature when this same pressing question of self-determination and self-definition, who we are and what we're really all about, is answered in a different register, couched not in the language of history or theology, but in the raw, vulnerable, and authentic emotional expression of the heart of the Hasid. The Hayom Yom on the 22nd of Yar recounts a Fabringen, a gathering of several early Hasidim who came together to bear their souls to one another. The question of the night was, what was the Uftu of Hasidut? What did Hasidut actually achieve and accomplish in the world? And they answered like this, Amal is the Rebbe Gevan Elent and the Tamidim Zainan Gevan Elent. Once upon a time, the Rebbe, the Master, the Teacher or the Sage was alone and their students were alone. But with the path of Chassidut, the Rebbe introduced the greatest godly achievement. In which the Rebbe is no longer lonely, and the Chassidim are no longer lonely. If you're still here and watching to the very end, thank you. 
I'd like you to know that here too you are not alone, and the degrees of separation between us are dwindling. It is only a matter of time before the universe shrinks even further, and we coalesce into conversation. The aim of this project is to make the journey from the alone to the alone a little less lonely, and I hope you feel it. I hope you enjoyed this class. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to our Patreons, who contribute so generously to keep this project going. Thank you to all of you. Thank you for watching, and keep seeking.